All right, and it looks like we are now recording. So welcome to tonight's Out of the Archives. I'm Jenna Lacqua, I'm Executive Director of the History Project, and we are Boston's LGBTQ Community Archives. Um, we're a 501c3 organization, we're volunteer driven, and we are dedicated to documenting, preserving, and sharing LGBTQ history. Um, so thank you for being with us here tonight and um, for taking part in this discussion. Originally, this event was going to happen in person and we, we've all moved to the cloud. So um, thank you for being here. I wanted to mention that while we are socially distanced, the History Project uh, launched a new project called Hashtag Queer Archives at Home. It's a crowdsourced digital archives of videos, pictures, stories, a space where we can come together during this time where we all have to be apart um, and experience each other's stories and history together. Uh, it's super easy to submit something to it, and I'm gonna put the link in the chat for you. Um, so please, while you're at home, um, take a look around you, take a look in your closet, and see if you have something around you that might represent your own history as part of our community. Uh, the other sort of plug I have is that we're very happy to be able to share LGBTQ history during this time. Um, if you can help us to achieve our mission, um, please consider making a donation to the History Project. I know we had a donate link on Eventbrite, and I want to thank those of you who did donate toward the History Project. Even though we can't be in the office or in the archives, we still have to pay the rent to keep the lights on uh, while we're away. So if you can support us, please do. We really appreciate it. And with that, uh, I'm going to introduce tonight's speaker, Zoya Davis Hamilton. So Zoya works in higher ed in Boston and is interested in questions of queer identity, which brought her to the History Project, where she conducted the research that led to tonight's presentation. Uh, we hope that the history serves as a jumping off point for further conversation about queer identity, labels, and community building. And now, Zoya, it's up to you. All right, I'm now unmuted. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Joan. And uh, this is my first time doing uh, an event with the History Project. And uh, uh, this is, in fact, uh, uh, it's not the first time that I'm using Zoom, but it is the first time that I'm doing a formal event on Zoom. So I was hoping uh, when uh, this was designed to be in person that I would be uh, seeing people in the room and be uh, energized by all of you being there and just uh, connecting with you like that. So I'm a little, I have to say, I'm a little nervous doing this by Zoom. And uh, um, Joan uh, reassured me that my credentials are sufficient to conduct a Zoom uh, event of this nature. <laughs> and uh, um, so uh, I wanted to start by um, sharing the screen. I will, I'm going to put up uh, my slides here. Let's see if this works. This is the first test of my speaker abilities. Uh, Joan, can people see my slides? Can you see the slides? I can't. Um, do you want me to share from my end? Yes, please, because I don't think this worked this time. Okay, sure. Just give me one second to pull it up. Although maybe I just succeeded, did I? No. Nope. <laughs> All righty. Let's see. I put these into presents. So in the first slide, you're going to see a cover of the book uh, that uh, was published by the History Project in 1998. Uh, uh, and uh, the book is a, uh, called uh, Improper Bostonians, Lesbian and Gay, uh, Gay History from the Puritans to Playland. And what that book is, uh, it's a compilation of LGBTQ themed material about the greater Boston and New England area. And uh, uh, the book is adapted from the uh, very successful exhibit uh, that uh, contained over 200 images uh, spanning over three centuries of gay and lesbian life in the Boston area. And uh, um, uh, uh, why uh, the book is part of this presentation is uh, that uh, this was sort of a jumping point, the beginning point of uh, um, my looking into this topic. And originally I thought that um, uh, I would just talk uh, for a few brief moments about uh, uh, the book, about uh, the history of um, uh, the things that I wanted to tell you about. 
and then we would have a prolonged discussion. But I think because it's a Zoom event, it evolved into a little longer presentation. So bear with me as I talk, but I do promise that uh, at the end we will have uh, a more interactive uh, part. And can everyone see that presentation now? Cool. Okay, we, we can go forward, please. Okay. So why, why did I think that the uh, history is a, a good jumping point uh, to the discussion? So I, I really wanted us today to talk about how uh, we find each other, how queer people um, find their community in a world that is not uh, obviously all queer. And uh, uh, why history comes into play is uh, that in the past it was dangerous to be out. And even the people that were out uh, such as people with privilege uh, uh, and those who could uh, afford to be out. They weren't out in a way that we consider being out today. And uh, there was a lot more risk to being out. So, but people still long to find the community and they still did. And we can, we can go to the next slide. So we're going to start with early America really quick. And of course, uh, Native American culture uh, had lots of examples of what we would now consider queer or trans. And uh, uh, when I was discussing with Joan how this presentation is going to be, Joan very aptly described um, it that first, uh, uh, first uh, the Bible said no, then uh, law said no, and then Madison said no. So the Bible was saying no, 17th century, same-sex attraction is considered moral degeneracy, and punishments were imposed as penance. And uh, uh, the uh, Puritan ministers were uh, considering sodomy um, as uh, um, uh, rapes and buggery were punishable by death uh, and uh, it was a sin and uh, it would provoke fire from heavens. And uh, you see here a picture of one such Puritan minister, Cotton Mather, which uh, I did not know that he actually um, was relevant to this presentation because I only heard his name as somebody who advocated for uh, inoculations against smallpox. Uh, but, and also in connection with witch trials, but, but here we go. So now the law said no, sodomy went from sinful to criminal during Victorian era. And of course, uh, one prominent example, I, I think many of you probably know, the sodomy trial of or Oscar Wilde, and that was in 1895, uh, right at the height of uh, his uh, success as a playwright. Uh, he went to jail for, I believe, two years, and then when he was released, uh, he died uh, uh, in uh, three years uh, in poverty. Um, so then, uh, how did medicine say no? Homosexuality uh, entered uh, medical analysis, and uh, uh, the theories, um, medical theories, were uh, really framed to portray homosexual behavior in a way that would fit the moral agenda or the social agenda. And uh, um, uh, what uh, is important to say that it wasn't just uh, the society view of um, homosexuality, but it was also what, uh, how people internalized it, how, people, how gay people saw them themselves uh, as uh, fitting these uh, medical descriptions. So now we advance to 1900s. Uh, and second, be, uh, between 19, uh, beginning of 1900s and Second World War. Uh, and of course, we have First World War and the Great Depression. And uh, um, the uh, people that uh, lived through the Great Depression and the war and made all these sacrifices, now they uh, swung uh, to, uh, in their head to be um, reclaiming this rigid and conventional notions of how the family should be, how sexual roles have to be. And a lot of people, uh, started carrying out uh, sort of self-appointed watchdog functions uh, to serve as keepers of the city morals. Uh, and it's dangerous uh, at this time to be uh, still, uh, to be out. Uh, people uh, were risking their uh, families, their careers. Sometimes uh, uh, they were risking of being uh, imprisoned or um, being put in the mental institution. So uh, we keep going through the history. Uh, so late 40s through 50s, McCarthy era campaigns. Uh, of course, uh, we all know about those. Um, but uh, the silver lining uh, of the fact that the resources of the state and the media were marshaled against homosexuals 
silver lining is that it helped to weld the subcultures together. It helped to build uh, the sense of community. And uh, despite the prosecutions, lesbian and, uh, and gays uh, continued to find each other. And uh, one thing that uh, I have this uh, on this slide, which really, uh, I think it is uh, sort of obvious, but it, I did not really um, kind of think about it until I started uh, looking at the materials of the History Project archive, that bars and gathering places were um, such special um, opportunities for uh, LGBT people to find community, to find some freedom, to find the opportunity to be together. And uh, um, it sort of, uh, was mitigating or setting a little bit of a, the threat of uh, loss of employment, loss of the family, and the threat of extortion. So we continue on, 50s to 70s, and uh, here we have first efforts to organize as a political constituency, uh, and uh, um, uh, in 1950 we have the creation of Mattachin Society, which is one, uh, one of the earliest LGBT organizations in the US that was in Los Angeles. And then 1955, we have uh, the creation of uh, the Daughters of Delighties in San Francisco, which is a lesbian civil and political rights organization. Um, so we, we are beginning to see uh, LGBTQ people to become visible and vocal in political and cultural life. And then uh, in another positive development, American Psychiatric Association removed the diagnosis of homosexuality from the DSM. Um, and uh, um, the uh, uh, homosexuality in Massachusetts was decriminalized uh, through the case of uh, Commonwealth versus Balthazar. And the way this case was framed, it was um, uh, through the notion of privacy that this decriminalization has occurred. Uh, so it was asserted that, um, in fact, uh, in the privacy of their own homes, homosexuality is okay. So it was still not really uh, okay to be gay, but, but you could do it at home, sort of. Okay. So this picture on the left, it's, it's really, really small. Um, but um, I uh, really wanted to share it with you. I found it in, uh, in the archive box of the History Project, and it is, I think it's from 1974, and it's a newsletter inviting uh, people to, to a party. And uh, um, I read it uh, several times over. Uh, I think were you trying to make it bigger, Joan? Uh I was clicking and forgot that I was sharing my screen. Welcome to technology, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm um, trying to see if I can pull it up a little bigger uh, on my screen, but I read it, I read it a couple of times because I really uh, saw that it was so colorful and so um, inviting. I would want to go to this party, but I was thinking to myself, how do I know how, if I were living at that time and I would see this newsletter, how would I know that this is a, an LGBTQ event. And I don't know if it is um, possible to depict from it or just because I know from the archive that it is an uh, LGBTQ event, that it, it sounds a little gay to me, but I'm going to read to you a little bit uh, from it and, and maybe you can, you can agree or disagree with me if, if it does sound a little gay to you. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to just read to you the first paragraph. You are cordially invited to attend another fabulous party at 15 uh, Lansonville Street and such and such time and day. There will be complimentary admission and brunch this Sunday. The brunch item includes our famous assorted omelets of Parmesan cheese, bacon and mixed herbs, imported French brie cheese, rolls and variety of delicious salads. Dessert will include specialty made crepes uh, of chocolate, strawberry, jelly, and cinnamon sugar topped with whipped cream. And then it goes on and on. And then at the end, it says, bring your whistles and tambourines. So uh, I, thought, I thought this was an amazing, amazing newsletter, sort of um, a special coming from 1974. So I put it here for all of you to enjoy. I don't know if uh, uh, anybody in the chat can say, does it sound gay to you? Or am I making this up or, or not? Feel free to put your comments there, which I can't see now, but Joan can. Um, so here we progressed um, in this time period uh, from uh, uh, just uh, identities of lesbian and gay to 
to other identities. And uh, 1973, we have uh, a, a origination of the trans club, what is now a trans club of New England. It started as Cherry Stone Club and later it split into social and support groups and support group became Tiffany Club. In uh, 1985, we have creation of the Bisexual Resource Center. And then uh, uh, other positive events, 1989, Massachusetts prohibits discrimination based on sexual orientation. And of course, uh, and gender identity was added later, in, uh, much later in 2016. And then of course, 2004, same-sex marriage becomes legal in Massachusetts. And uh, uh, 2015, uh, marriage becomes same-sex marriage becomes legal in the U.S. Okay. So, how to find each other? We can just proceed forward. Um, so that's <laughs> that. That made me uh, laugh a little bit uh, when I was reading uh, the book. Uh, and uh, um, I, I just thought, well, this is easy. You just come over to somebody and say, are you gay? <laughs> but um, up until the mid-50s, uh, 1950s, uh, gay was a secret word that only um, LGBT people uh, understood. And uh, uh, why the word gay was picked because homosexual was too clinical and queer at that time was considered der derogatory. So um, here we come to a friend of Dorothy, and I'm going to turn the floor to the expert. Oh, dear. <laughs> you have been warned. Um, okay, let's see. Am I unmuted? You are. Yep, you're unmuted. Gosh, well, uh, most people seem to think that the expression um, refers to Judy Garland in the MGM movie of The Wizard of Oz. Um, there are a lot of, lot of reference books that say that in dictionaries, if they list the origin, they tend to list that. And I spent a lot of time as part of my research um, looking into why gay men love The Wizard of Oz, not just the MGM movie, but the Oz books. Um, and there were some alternate theories. I forgot about the, the well, this polychrome one, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I've seen that quote before, but um, some believe, I wonder who these some are. I mean, who, I'm not sure who they are. <laughs> but uh, Dorothy Dean and Dorothy um, Parker were proposed as other, other, other Dorothys that it might have been. One linguist I talked to said that it doesn't have to have in, any reference. Uh, the Dorothy may not be anybody. And you gave as an example another another um, expression, drunk is Cooter Brown. There isn't any Cooter Brown. It was just like a colorful expression that someone came up with. Um, and one way I thought that I could help figure out which, which Dorothy or not might have been the, the origin was to look at earlier documentation of when the, the phrase was first used. And some people have asserted without documentation that it was used in the 40s and 50s. Um, but I couldn't find any, any uh, evidence for that. I had friends look in archival, keep their eyes open when they were looking through diaries and, and letters. Of course, it was gay slang and coded at that. It was a secret code, supposedly, to refer to gay, gay men, friends of Dorothy. And so you wouldn't expect to see it in public much. But um, I also came across some slang uh, study, studies that looked at gay slang in the 60s. And one of them listed 60 or 70 different synonyms for gay, like poofter and fudge packer and so on, light in the loafers. And Friend of Dorothy wasn't listed there. Uh, and I, I looked in a whole lot of other sources in the 50s and 60s, and um, it was just surprising that it wasn't there. And my, my theory is that really it was more of a post Stonewall thing as a way, but people like the idea of it being used earlier than that, and it gives us a sense of history and combines, you know, since we can't pass culture down through our family, one way you can pass culture down is through folkloric beliefs and, and culture. And so it's sort of when you get a mentor or initiated however you do into uh, LGBTQ culture, you learn these things and um, it makes you feel connected to the past. And there are a bunch of other related myths about Judy Garland and um, the Wizard of Oz that I think are part of this constellation of beliefs that I call folkloric beliefs, but I don't, you know, I don't, I could talk about this for a real long time, but I'll stop there. But I've got 
lots of citations and references. Um, if anybody wants them, I can send out an email or something. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I think I would be reluctant to to say for sure that it came from uh, the road to Oz, especially after I uh, heard you. Uh, uh, but um, uh, where I'm going with that is that people used euphemisms to uh, convey to each other that they were uh, gay. And if we go to the next slide, uh, there's certainly not 50 here. Uh, oh. One more. One more, oh, maybe, yeah, we can return to that one. Uh, there's not 50 here, but there is there is a fair number uh, that uh, Joan uh, and I um, put on here. So I wanted, some of them are pretty self-explanatory. I wanted to talk a little bit about Ganymede and Jupiter. So Ganymede was um, uh, a son of the first king of Troy and he tended sheep. And uh, um, so Jupiter came down from the Olympus and uh, saw Ganymede and he was so uh, overwhelmed and enamored by the beauty of uh, Ganymede that he wanted to bring him uh, to Olympus to serve uh, as a cub bearer of the gods. So Jupiter turned into an eagle and uh, um, carried Ganymede up. But uh, of course, uh, things are not uh, always uh, straightforward and so there was some competition with Hebe, who was uh, Jupiter's daughter and uh, who was at the time serving as a cup uh, server to the gods. But uh, ultimately, Ganymede prevailed somehow, I can't remember right now how, uh, in that competition and uh, he stayed on as the favorite uh, companion of Jupiter. So that's the myth. So then the next one is macaroni, which is also not very obvious what it is. Uh, my understanding is that uh, it was the uh, word that was given to uh, people that preferred uh, strange continental European uh, dishes like pasta to more traditional dishes. Uh, so it was sort of fancy people, that's where this comes from. And then we have uh, Boston marriage and maybe we can go back and visit that for, for a quick second. Um, and that was one back. Boston marriage is uh, uh, what uh, uh, women were called uh, that uh, lived together as companions without any financial support from guys, sort of girls being pals situation, modern words. So um, I don't know if we wanted, now we can go back to the, to the next one. I just felt like I needed to return to that slide. It was just weighing on me. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's, um, I think it makes sense before we jump forward. Um, Cause Boston marriage, as a term and as a sort of relationship status took place mostly in the, the late 1800s, um, usually among upper class women, Boston Brahmin kind of types. Um, there's a whole debate and a whole soapbox I could get on about whether or not that means these women were in a sexual relationship with each other or not, but if you share a bed for 50 years. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but there, there are lots of examples of women that we know about from this time period, again, because they were from a class of people who could live like this, could support one another, um, and could uh, be out in a way that we have documentation about. So then we have dandies, uh, which are men devoted to fashion and style. And then um, the other one that uh, is probably worth talking a minute about Uranian love. Uh, so Uranians were, and that's the quote, female, uh, female psyche in a male body people. And that's where that comes from. Personally, that's my favorite because it sounds, it sounds so, so cool, I don't know. So I, I have no uh, other uh, comments to make about all the other terms listed here, but Joan, if you, if you have any other ones you want to talk about, feel free. Sure. Um, I think some of them are interesting. Some of them you can sort of tell, like, you know, spinsters and tomboys, I think, are, are words that have stayed the same over time. Um, you, you know what we're talking about. Um, Man of perverted tendency sounds like something from a Hayes Code movie. Like, <laughs> Oh, look out for him. He's a man of perverted tendencies. Um, smashing is fun. Smashing is usually used or was used uh, to talk about girl crushes. Um, generally women who are at women's college who have these really um, deeply emotional crushes on each other and flings and sort of pair off. Um, I've seen it used uh, sort of to describe the idea of lesbians until graduation. 
Um, I don't know if the kids are still using that, but that was a thing when I was in college. Like, oh, you know her, she's a lesbian until graduation, then she'll marry a guy and have a white picket fence. Um, so it's smashing. Uh, impersonators was generally used, I've seen it mostly used uh, for men who dress up as women, um, sort of a precursor to what we now call a drag queen. Um, and then sexual invert is the idea that like your um, sexuality is inverted. Um, it's sort of a clinical term that, that sneaks its way into um, general use in the early 1900s. Um, but yeah, are there other terms that we might want to add here or, or that um, anyone thinks is like distinctly missing from this list? Can I, can I say something about macaroni? Yeah. Well, um, if you think about Yankee Doodle, he stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni. I mean, that sounds sort of like the dandy idea. You're putting a feather in your cap and you're getting more elaborate. I mean, I have no idea if that's connected or not, but that was the first thing that jumped to mind to me. Yeah, it's, it's sort of tied up in this like um, effeminate, uh, over the top camp sort of costume. Um, not co like costume in terms of dress, not like dressing up as someone, but like sort of the outfit that you put on. Um, oh I think specifically used around in, in the 1700s. Um, although I'm not an expert on that time period. I tend to, it's funny that this is uh, so pre-Stonewall because as a, a person interested in history, I'm like 1950 forward. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, oh, and uh, in the chat, Ellen says, Kiki used to be used as a term for bi women. Which, um, Ellen, I won't, you don't have to unmic, uh, unmute yourself if you don't want to, but is there anything else you want to say about that term? I've seen it in print, but I've never heard it used, or like, I don't know what the etymology of it is. There was a gay, gay male performing group called Kiki and Herb. Oh, here, uh, I'm gonna unmute Maida. Uh, um, yeah, Maida, um, it's my understanding that term, that term was Kai, said Kai Kai, and it meant the woman, a woman who couldn't decide if she was butch or femme, not necessarily bisexual. Um, I think that's a very different definition of it. I've heard Kai Kai used by drag queens, like drag queens who sleep with other drag queens would Kai Kai with each other. I don't um, know, I'm just knowing this lesbian context that I- Yeah, and Ellen in. is saying in the chat that it was also used for, for bi women. Um, so I think that shows that these terms sort of, they change over time and also, um, I think that they, they sometimes become very hyper-local um, so let's see, um, someone, Robert, or just like, the, oh, Molly, I'm sorry, I was just going to say just like the term queer, which you brought up was derogatory and now in, you know, it, it's, it's used differently. And even in my lifetime, it wasn't used till I was in graduate school. It kind of came back and it was, you know, owned like the word, uh, like faggot was owned, was, you know, started to become owned by gay men. So I, it, it's interesting that terms can be negative in one generation and then turn and become positive or used to empower uh, other generations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Actually, Yankee was like that. It was originally a term of derision by the British about the colonies, and then they took it on as a as a badge of self worth. So it's ex exactly parallel to faggot or queer. Those are great points. Um, I only have two more slides to go, and then we can talk about modern day uh, things uh, as opposed to history things. So maybe uh, if you don't all don't mind, if we could. Go to the next two slides, and then we can open it up to discussion how we, uh, what we do today. I think that would be interesting too. Sure, sorry, I jumped the gun. Um, 
All right, so what else you could do uh, in the past to be uh, sort of uh, 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 a little bit uh, obscure and not very direct, you can reference the books uh, and our people. So the books, the book that I uh, saw uh, that was referenced is uh, Psychopathy of Sex. I, I don't know, I would personally have trouble weaving a, a book like this and with the author name that I can't even begin to pronounce in a conversation, but um, just to, for those of you who don't know, it was a forensic reference book for psychiatrists, physicians, and judges, and it was written in a very technical language with a high barrier for, for understanding for um, general population. And uh, the gist of the book was that any form of recreational sex is a perversion, perversion and sex uh, only uh, uh, is uh, for procreation. So uh, I suppose you could um, reference this book in a conversation somehow to, to let the other person know that you are gay. You could uh, uh, bring up Oscar Wilde or Mae West. And uh, Mae West uh, uh, is uh, uh, famous for her play Drag that uh, uh, never was um, shown on Broadway and uh, because it portrayed homosexuality and cross-dressing and it was uh, banned. And so um, this uh, is not specific to Boston. In fact, this is a, a UK thing. Uh, and uh, uh, you can uh, find a really uh, nice 10 minute video if you Google uh, Polari uh, BBC uh, video or BBC Polari video. And uh, so there was this made up language that uh, uh, had uh, roots in uh, different cultures, but uh, for the most part, Italian and uh, Roman uh, words and uh, rhyming slang. And so, bada to bada, your dolly all week means good to see your nice face. And um, what was interesting in that BBC video that I found that BBC was in fact introducing to listeners to the general public this language and gay culture with it. And uh, uh, at the height of its uh, popularity, uh, the audience was 20 million viewers. And uh, uh, it was, the show was called Round the Horn, and it was uh, um, in 1966 that it was played. And shortly after, there were some cultural changes in acceptance of um, uh, the LGBT in the UK. So BBC opinion, I think, is that the show played a role in that. And of course, the, here is, uh, the, are the other words. I think some of them uh, you mentioned maybe, and the other ones, uh, also probably self-explanatory. Yeah, so these, um, I added these to the, the slide about sort of coded language and slang. Um, there are a lot that could be its own linguistics presentation that we could give, um, but I tried to choose a couple that were sort of part of the spectrum of um, words and terms that uh, most people who are part of the queer community know about um, or could, uh, figure out if they were presented with in the world. Um, and there are a lot more terms that we could get into um, that are, are used in everyday life. Okay, and then the next one is yours. Oh yeah, so um, uh, again, this is another slide that I added in as Zoe and I were sort of editing through these, um, thinking about in addition to coded language and ways in which you could single uh, a signal um, queer identity through what you're wearing where you wouldn't know what it means unless you knew, um, sort of under the radar things. So uh, the image on the left is the Boston Eagle hanky code. Uh, this is a, a scan from the History Project's archives. Um, we have uh, used this uh, for the last couple of years when we've thrown hanky parties in Boston. Um, we sell handkerchiefs, there's a DJ, everyone chooses what color they want. We always choose the wrong color to buy and don't sell that one while everyone requests like pink or something, uh, depending on the crowd. So uh, if you're not familiar with the hanky code, it's the idea that uh, a handkerchief of a certain color placed in your back pocket, depending on the sides, shows what you are into or looking for in an evening or what you're not looking for. So, um, Red is fisting, and that's usually the uh, example, and one of the colors that's seen throughout the country and sort of internationally when you talk about the hanky code, like I said, this is Boston's hanky code that the Eagle put out 
um, another copy of the code from San Francisco or from elsewhere would be a little bit different. There's not like a unified code out there um, or like some sort of canon of what the hanky code is. But yeah, so so red's fisting. If you put it on your left, you're you're into fisting. If you put it on your right, you're into getting fisted and so on and so forth. Um, so now it's kind of fun. It was used a lot uh, in the 1970s or sort of pre-AIDS crisis. It's making um, a comeback in fashion now. A lot of sort of um, fetish gear companies are using more and more hanky code um, patterns and uh, accents to what they're putting out. Um, and the other example I came up with sort of um, that I think is kind of interesting is Harvard's Cult of the Purple Rose. Um, the idea that Harvard students who were gay men would wear a lot of lavender to, to signify to each other who they were. Um, and that could be anything from like a lavender carnation through to like a whole lavender outfit as, as um, one of the Harvard grads describes. Um, and that's late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, and there are other examples of sort of coded dress um, without getting too into like a debate over like butch and femme and what does it mean to be butch, but like lesbians and flannel is one that is particularly um, of, at least of my generation, I don't know how historically far back it goes. Um, gay men and cutoffs, uh, we can go on and on. So, yeah. Right, and so now this is a question for the audience here. Uh, we might have uh, um, started on this conversation already, and uh, uh, I think uh, tied to that is, uh, along with the historical ways, how do LGBTQ people find each other today? Yeah, and I can read off, so I'm, I'm still moderating. Um, if folks want to, they can put things into the chat and I can read them out. Um, or if you click the hand raise icon, I can pass the mic to you and that way no one's like talking over each other. Um, but a couple of questions that popped up in the chat. Uh, one was about the origination of the term Boston marriage. So Henry James um, wrote about it in his book, The Bostonians. There were two women in the book who he described as being in a Boston marriage with each other. Um, so that's where the term comes from. Evidently, it was really popular in Boston at the time. Um, I've heard it in other contexts, but as I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking of like New York context, which in the grand scheme of things, doesn't necessarily mean much. Um, the next question was about the term smashing. Um, so I've heard that in, in reference to like early 20th century women at women's college. But um, yeah, smashing is now used as a term for sex in general. And then there's um, a comment from Rebecca about Carl Henrik Ulrichs who wrote about the Iranians as a reference to a third sex derived from Aphrodite Urania. And there's an entire genre of homoerotic poetry known as Uranian poetry. Um, and Ulrich's term for feminine homosexuality was weebling. Weeb am I pronouncing that? Um, Rebecca also mentions newsletters and pen pals. Um, and then we have left versus right keys and earrings. Okay, D, I'll unmute you. <laughs> uh, there we go. Yeah, I mean, in the in the 70s, the, the idea of the way you folks talked about the hanky, hanky code on the left, it was supposed to be active or wanting and right was passive. The same, there was a related folkloric practice or whatever that if you wore your keys on your right, you were generally a passive or a receptive, anal receptive guy. And if it was on the left, you wanted to fuck. Um, and with the earrings, I can't remember which was which, but one side, if you had an ear, Earring in your right ear, maybe it was you were gay, and if you were left, you were straight. It was before people were just hard as it may be to believe. You know, back in the seventies, men generally didn't wear earrings, but the cutting edge guys did. In one, and then somebody once told me it was the opposite in Rhode Island, <laughs> that if you were let, you were in the left, that meant you were gay in Boston, but in the right, it was in Rhode Island. And I don't know, you know, <laughs> it was pretty crazy. <laughs> D, I heard an expression once which uh, stuck in my head. It's left is right and right is wrong, meaning right was the gay. Co correct. Oh. Yeah. yeah, so there's um, a comment about 
to, to keep us on the the earring uh, or piercing train, um, Joanne mentions women with uh, tongue studs as being sort of a signifier. Um, and then Tony mentions um, to find each other in the past, attending a camp film and seeking out others who are laughing at the right moments, mm. um, which is an interesting one. Um, and I'm going to put Tony on the spot. Tony hosts a, a very campy film screening every year for friends. Um, and you, you watch these movies that uh, if other people were watching them, probably wouldn't be laughing at the same moments as the entirely gay, like mystery science theater audience is laughing and making comments about. It's a very different experience than watching things with your straight friends who are kind of like, what? What is this? Go ahead, Dee. <laughs> um, people have written about watching The Wizard of Oz in the Castro Theater and how all of a sudden they were surrounded with people who laughed at some of the lines like some people go both ways. Um, and it's just, it's very different watching it with an all gay or mostly gay audience and how, how the, you know, that, that recognition and la laughter bonds people together. And people have also talked about clacks of gay men attending Judy Garland concerts in the late 50s and early 60s and how that was sort of an early way to meet other gay men. And also I think at the opera too, in San Francisco, there's this tradition of men wearing leather to go to the opera. <laughs> I'm not sure when that, what era that was, but certainly in the late 70s and early 80s, that was one thing that people did. But my, my father was gay and he, there were also um, outdoor cruising areas that were a way that people, some, some men met if they knew that. I mean, there was the Rambles in Central Park uh, and other places that people knew in different cities. Um, I think that was really important for a certain segment of the population. Yeah, to jump off that idea of knowing where to go, knowing, being in the know, if you know. Um, there's a story that we have in an oral history at the History Project where um, the interviewer is talking about leaving the army after World War II, um, having found community while in the army and then coming back to Boston and thinking, what am I going to do? Mm. And somebody told him, you're going to go to Downtown Crossing and you're going to go shopping and you're going to find um, a very, he didn't say effeminate man, but you're going to find a very effeminate man. You're going to start following him. And eventually he's going to lead you to a gay bar. And so this guy did that. He followed this, this man through several stores. Uh, <laughs> And eventually he led him to Sporters um, on Cambridge Street, right on the edge of Beacon Hill. Uh, and the joke is that he went to Sporters and didn't leave for 40 years. <laughs> <clears throat> so are we ready to move on to current times? Sure. Does anyone have any other stories they want to share? Or I'm keeping an eye on the chat and the, the hand raise feature. Um, well, I, I would talk a lot, so feel free not to call on me. <laughs> but it's in, the, in the 70s, after, when, I, when I came out, um, my feeling was if I went to a gay bar, all of a sudden I'd have all these brothers and we'd share so much. And it wasn't the case. And I, I think uh, talking to a lot of people, they had that same experience of the initial euphoria followed by disenchantment because there were still people with very different values um, and different interests. And then in the late 70s and 80s is when a lot of the special interest groups took off, starting with the gay choruses, I think, in San Francisco. But then there were softball leagues. I mean, lesbian softball leagues were probably around before then, but um, outing clubs and choruses especially. And I think my theory, the reason why these groups um, took off was that you had this second thing in common. So you could actually talk about something. And if you were into the outdoors, that was sort of a value. So all the people in the Chiltern Mountain Club, for example, you know, were outdoorsy. They might've been into potlucks and a whole cluster of things that tended to go together. And so you really did have shared values. We were much more likely to make friends than with an average random person in a bar. Um, that thing, that's sort of my theory about, you know, the choruses took off really quickly, gay square dancing, um, was having a second interest. The other reason why they were nice is that it was 
a safe space that like a bar, you could talk about being gay and not have to worry about being judged or being beaten up or whatever. So having the safe place plus the second interest in common, I think was why these were so popular. That's great. I think that's a really good segue into the, the sort of last slide um, because that's still going on now. Just the, the clubs that you've talked about, there's still gay bowling and gay flag football and gay... Um, there's a tennis, I think, in Boston, isn't there? Yeah, and, and more than one dance club. Um, not like club club, but like uh, gays for Patsy and uh, mm. dancing queerly. No, that's a company, but there are lots of examples. Yeah, yeah. So in contemporary world, I think uh, it's a little different for a uh, younger generation because people really, uh, I think what I am seeing around uh, is people really do ask each other, are you gay? <laughs> and uh, uh, because uh, they do look uh, like straight people because, uh, you know, being gay is uh, okay now. But um, uh, when I had first come out uh, and it, I was not uh, in college, I it was much later in life, uh, I was uh, sort of training my gay down, uh, watch watching the L word and I'm trying to figure out which actress was gay in real life and which one was not. And uh, um, so there were a lot of characters there that I thought might be gay, but what I knew for sure is that Beth and Tina were not gay. And uh, so that's kind of how I uh, solidified my, my gay dar, if you will. But um, uh, seriously though, if you wanted, if you were in an environment where you wouldn't know if somebody's gay or not, short of asking them, are you gay? Maybe it's at work and maybe you're just curious and you don't want to date this person or socialize with them, but you just want to know, how do you know? So there's a couple of comments and um, I'll unmute you in a second, Jonathan. Um, Rochelle says political movements, feminism and involvement with women's movement was also a way that lesbians met and often a place where many women came out. Um, and I can think of a story of a friend of mine saying that she got involved with gender studies in the 70s after being married to a 70s and then after being married to a man um, and divorced him and has been a lesbian, I mean, before, but ever since. Um, and then another comment about political movements and groups, pride marches, gay community news, there's like a, a meeting space and a place to meet other people around issues and, and movement. And then here you go, Jonathan, you're unmuted, or you should be. Uh, you're still muted. I'm not sure why it's not letting me unmute you. Maybe you have to. How about now? They're perfect, thank you. Can you hear me now? Okay, so one of the things I was thinking is because I've done it before is social media. I've gone to Facebook and looked at uh, someone's friends or what, or, or what movies they like or books they like or, you know, what pages they like. I think that can often be a way of, um, not always, but it can be a way of seeing what, whether, you know, there's evidence that someone might be gay, better, more evidence that someone could be gay. I like that, evidence, looking for evidence. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. There's, uh, when I was coming out, which I am, uh, I'm a millennial. So when I was coming out, uh, which was a little bit later than most of my generation was in the, the 2010s, we had Gorilla Queer Bar, which was um, basically you were on an email list and uh, Thursday night, they would email you and say, we're taking over, I can't remember any of the names of the bars because I haven't done it in many years, but like, we're taking over this bar in Fenway and we're all gonna show up at 8.30 and then suddenly there would be 200 queer people all in a space together and you just effectively turn a straight bar into a gay bar for the night. And it was a way of sorting assert sort of asserting that we were here, um, that we were, you know, part of the community and we didn't have to only go for for gay two gay bars. Uh, Rebecca says that's called zapping, which I've never heard before. That's so interesting. I, I think that still exists. I, I think it's called the welcoming committee because I used to go to the Gorilla Queer bars too because I, I came out 2009. So, um, and yeah, I think it still exists. 
I think that's where it exists because I have gone to the welcoming committee event uh, on uh, Valentine's Day and they did take over a bar that was not a gay bar. Yeah, does anyone else have any other stories they want to tell? Oh, cares. Sarah, you're unmuted. Um, Zoya knows this person, but I think that uh, the HR statute of limitations has passed, so it's okay to tell the story. Um, when I was being interviewed at my current job, the person interviewing me asked me what music I liked because she thought I was a lesbian. And it was, you know, I like Ani DeFranco. What kind of music do you like? And I was like, oh, the Indigo Girls, right. And that was a way that we established that we were both queer without saying it out loud. Again, probably not HR sanctioned way around the rules about asking. <laughs> so yeah, any other comments or ideas? I'm asking for you. <laughs> Oh, Carrie, here, I'm going to unmute you. Or at least I'm clicking unmute and it's not letting me. There we go. Does that work? Yep. I don't know. This goes back in the historical section, I guess. And I was just curious if anybody knew if there was any truth to it. But when I first came out in the late 70s, um, somewhere along the line, somebody introduced me to this supposed handshake that you know, if you extended your hand and, and they at the last minute slipped their middle finger down so it, it uh, was inside your palm, that was supposed to be a sign that they were gay. And I've had many people that have, you know, done that little joke or something. I never, you know, encountered somebody <laughs> and, and discovered they were gay that way. I always knew they were already gay, but does anybody know about that, the origin of that or, or the truthfulness of that? The only thing that comes to mind in the middle of pandemic is that we are not likely yeah, to uh, carry that. Happen. Oh, Jonathan, were you saying that actually happened? Oh, you're muted again. Yeah, sorry. Uh, that that did actually happen to me. <laughs> it was a, a, a guest uh, critic at uh, the Graduate School of Design. Uh, a friend of my instructor and I just saw him on the street and we chatted and then he stuck out his hand and he did exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> it was a little creepy actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's it reminds me it's like the stare when you go out somewhere and you sort of look around the room. Um, my friends used to call it a fruit loop. I don't know how politically correct that is but um, as you sort of walked around and sort of you stare down people you were interested in just to see if they looked back. Um, so somebody in the chat is saying a local politician now retired used to use that handshake. Um, I could guess who that is, but we're being recorded. Um, other comments are uh, when Emily came out in the early 2000s, she used to go, I assume he or she, I apologize if I'm wrong. Um, and I apologize for assuming, uh, they used to go to the Amazon Poetry Slam in Cambridge. Um, Mike mentions uh, travels another way, lesbian and gay cruises and tours, destinations like P-Town. Uh, Emily mentions the lesbian nod. Which, I don't know what that is. Oh, it's the, you give somebody a look and you just kind of, you give them the head up down. As somebody who presents pretty femmy, um, I do that when I go into queer spaces to try to signal that I'm not a bachelorette. Um, we had, Marvin, did, were you trying to raise your hand? Here, I've unmuted you, Marvin. Um, I mean, that was the, the stare is just old fashioned cruising. I mean, you'd be, and this goes way you know, back into this, you know, when I came out in the late sixties and in, in the seventies, you know, walking down the street, if you saw somebody you liked, uh, you just stare at them. And as you walked by, you'd continue to stare and then you'd wait like, you know, 10 seconds and turn around and to see if they turned around as well. And that was a way of doing a pickup out in, in, in public. And nobody else knew that you were doing that except the other gay person. That's 
great. Um, oh, here, Mary. I've unmuted you, Mary. Uh, yes, I would often ask, have you been to the Saints uh, as a come on? And I also wanted to comment about that letter that someone read uh, the, with the menu. Mm -hmm. There was no mention of quiche, so I would presume that was not a gay uh, invitation. <laughs> and that brings up the question is how quiche became a gay lesbian uh, meal. I don't know. That's the first thing that comes to mind is, are quiche good for potlucks? And then I'm not sure what my, uh, why I'm asking that, but that, that seems to be a connection for me. Here, uh, I'm gonna do D, I'm gonna unmute you, and then Jonathan, I saw you. Yeah, well, there was definitely a stereotype, one of the stereotypes of lesbians was that they had lots of potlucks. Um, the other thing about quiche is that it's a French dish and it may tie into the other stereotype of the dandies and the, past, the pasta lover macar macaroni people. <laughs> it's just a fancier, more sophisticated palate or something. Oh. Yeah, there was, that book, there was that book, Real Men Don't Eat, Eat Quiche. I'm not sure when that came out, probably in the 70s. There was something. It's just very homophobic. Mm. There was a, a, a meme making the, route, the, the rounds this week about um, a, a straight woman saying, if I go out to dinner with a man, I don't want him to order an appetizer or dessert. That's sissy. And a lot of people saying, what's wrong with straight people? Why are they worried about this? Um, so Maya, I see you. I'm going to unmute you. I'm going to try to unmute you. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to say, I think that Huge thing probably came with the with the interest in vegetarianism, and you know real men are not vegetarians. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Aaron, Jonathan, will unmute you, or you can unmute yourself. I yeah. Well, a couple of things. It could have also uh, come about because Julia Child started in the '60s, and you know they still play those. Uh, they still broadcast on PBS her early shows, and she makes quiche in one show. And if you watch those early shows, they're really, um, she's uh, addressing everything to housewives. So maybe maybe part of it was was that too, that it's, it's uh, you know, this feminizing, I guess. The other thing I was going to say, it was, kind of, it was before my time, but not only food, but there was a soda called Tab. D, I don't know if you remember that. I remember the can. It was a pink can. <laughs> and maybe because it was pink, it was considered a gay drink, I think. Is that right? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> All right. So, Priscilla, I see you. And I've clicked to unmute you, but I'm not sure if it is working this evening. So if you unmute yourself. Am I unmuted? Yeah, perfect. Wonderful. Uh, nobody's mentioned New Words Bookstore in Cambridge or Bread and Roses Restaurant where a lot of lesbians met each other. And the gay men that I knew in Harvard Graduate School in the late 60s went to the Church of the Advent High Anglican churches were a good place for gay men to meet and a safe place to take even the most closeted of their parents. One of my friends from Pennsylvania, when his mother visited, went to the church and she remarked on how nice it was to see so many young men worshiping. <laughs> oh, that's good. Um, Maida's mention mentioning uh, Michigan and the Women's Festival. And I think it's it's interesting to point out if we're thinking about today and we're thinking about 2020, um, there are so fewer spaces and I think events like that now to to literally go and find other people. Um, that it's interesting that we're both we're kind of throwing in sort of ideas about what happened in the past and um, 
but trying to think about them in the perspective of now, what would you do now if you didn't already have a queer community to talk to or to, to connect with? That is actually a really good question. And I try to do this. Uh, I'm a transplant to the Boston area and I try to find the community. And the way that I found it was through Meetup, uh, although I was a little disappointed in, in some of the events that uh, uh, were offered through Meetup. But uh, that was that was my first step. Oh, and somebody's, uh, Joanne's saying it's hard to find people in person because everything is on a dating app. I just saw that I think either Grindr or Scruff um, is, is using, um, is doing like a friend meetup now. I wouldn't know, I'm not on either, so I can't say with authority which one it is. Um, but friends of mine were like, isn't it great? Now we can just like chat with people and it's not like, you know, are you hosting? <laughs> Yep, D. Um, gay bookstores, I don't think we've talked about yet. Um, yeah, the, was mentioned, but. The, yeah, the, um, the, Christ, the Oscar Wilde on Christopher Street was, I mean, they had a big notice board where people would, would leave notes about wanting roommates and all sorts of stuff. And, and back before there were gay community centers, in some ways, those early bookstores were like community centers. They would have some, you know, author readings and some group events, but it was more sort of finding individual books and getting the, getting the newspapers and seeing these notices and they were you know there was glad day in new york and then um i'm sorry in boston that moved to a bunch of different places and then other bookstores that have closed people say because amazon and the internet uh and i think in general that's sort of the lament that bars bars and organizations have gone out of business because people can find each other through the internet i mean it's whether that's really true or not who knows but that's the theory yeah, so um, Debbie. Oh, uh, we think the world of you, yeah. Oh. Cuddy hunk, whatever. Glad day, Hello. Cambridge Women's Center. Yeah, Debbie. Yeah, so I was just going to kind of follow up on what I think uh, Priscilla and uh, Maida and, and now Dee have, have said that, you know, bookstores, I feel like we're, are, we're really an essential location for people to meet each other, um, even in some ways a little more than community centers because you could – you could kind of cruise women and, for, and especially for lesbians you could kind of cruise and see what well they look what kind of books they're looking at and then the events that they would have their bulletin boards i mean it was like such an i mean that's where i met my partner right i mean like they're really essential places and on lots of different levels um for uh, people to meet but it is interesting and also intergenerationally right which i think is one of the things that is missing now with so much stuff that's online um, and I do feel like the dating apps are really uh, geared towards younger people for sure. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to bring out bookstores again because I, I feel like they really, uh, for gay men and lesbians, were really the heart of our community in a lot of ways. I mean, I have no idea how people meet uh, people now, even as friends, right? It's incredibly difficult just as, you know, not necessarily as lovers, but friends also. Yeah, so thank you. Um, in the chat, Tony mentioned uh, Marquis de Sade, we think the world of you in Boston, Glad Day Bookstores mentioned, um, Cambridge Women's Center as a place to meet, queer-focused meditation nights. I've seen um, uh, gay gamer nights, both like board games and video games, um, sort of as a place, like you were saying, Zoya, to meet together, where it's like, we're a gay group and. Um, and then Rebecca mentions, uh, meeting a bunch of people at the history project, which is how, uh, I did it. And then Ellen, do you want to chime in or do you not mean to be unmuted? Yeah, I did actually. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say just a, a little perspective of the Boston bi women's community in particular and the bi, the bi community in general, because, um, it was so nice to see the bust, the bisexual resource center mentioned on the timeline because you know it's um, it's a, a long-term community organization here that has fostered an incredibly vibrant um, by community and the Boston the uh, Cambridge Women's Center had a long-running by women's rap group 
that for me was when I first moved to Boston, incredible. I still am connected to the women that I met there. And, um, and also from an extension from that, you started learning about the Boston Bisexual Women's Network. And you know these are women who I go to brunches with for the last 25 years. And this is a, an incredible grassroots community organization where bi folks can meet each other and in a very comfortable, safe social space. Um, and, uh, and in fact, and, and you don't have to identify as bi to participate in that community space. There are many lesbians who have felt comfortable within the community and they, and they come out in bi space first to feel comfortable and then come out as lesbian. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful place just to have that safety uh, to, in, in, to, to explore your own identity and to feel comfortable, learn about the community and, um, and then go from there and kind of figure out your identity and, and what, you, what you want and what you need. Um, and still now there are many different bi groups for women, for men, for mixed gender groups, um, that are still that still serve the greater Boston area. Thank you. And that that sort of brings to mind. So people are mentioning in the chat, uh, Sojourner newspapers like Sojourner, which was heavily lesbian feminist, gay community news, Bay Windows, um, OLOC, older lesbians organizing for change, senior center, LGBTQ groups. Um, and just thinking about the the sort of now that there are so many more bi groups, there are also I've met several friends. I've never gone to a meeting, but I've met several friends who were part of the uh, New England Asexual Group, which I didn't know existed until I mean ten years ago now. But um, who sort of they found each other on the internet and started meeting up and and having fun together, um, and lots of of smaller sort of like trans groups and support groups and, and organizations that have popped up. Um, it's interesting to try to document them all now um, because some of them last for, for several years, some of them last for a couple of meetings. It's kind of like starting a book club and then no one reads the book. <laughs> <laughs> what it feels like. <laughs> like we're all gonna come together and do this thing and then after a couple of months it fizzles out and then another one pops up, which is actually really wonderful, right? That, you know, we we're, safe and, and secure and to have these places and to find each other. Um, so just being aware of time, we're like 10 minutes past eight. So maybe, and we're only supposed to go to eight. So I don't want to keep anyone too late or keep them from their, you know, 8 p.m. happy hour or anything. Um, Sorry, do you have any last thoughts for us? Uh, this has been really amazing. And uh, uh, thank you so much. And I uh, wasn't sure how the event by Zoom would go, but I think I think it was it, it we were still connecting, or I felt connected to, to this group. I hope other people share this. And I'm hoping uh, to do another talk in a little bit. Uh, depends on when Joan lets me speak again. Uh, but uh, the topic that I'm interested to discuss with all of you, hopefully, uh, is about labels and uh, uh, how they are helpful, how they are not helpful in uh, um, uh, developing identity and the use of labels for that. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And uh, back to you, Joan. Yeah, so if you have any ideas about um, a topic or um, anything you'd like us to look into, or if you have any friends who have written a book or who have a documentary that they'll let us screen over Zoom, um, or anything like that, please reach out to info at historyproject.org. That goes to me. Um, and we could schedule something. Um, two weeks from now, we're going to do another Out of the Archives talk with uh, Raul Cormier about the Hanky Code. So if you were uh, feeling titillated by that slide with the Hanky Code, uh, Raul has a really great presentation that he's going to give, and he's really the authority in New England on the topic. Um, so, so keep an eye out uh, in your email and on our, our social media pages for info about how to sign up for that one. Um, and yes, the link for donations, is it still in my paste? So it's historyproduct.org slash support. Um, if you go to our website and click support, it gives you uh, several different ways in which you can support the history project. Um, 
And uh, I also would like to pitch again, uh, hashtag queer archives at home. If you have a library around you or t-shirts or old photos or um, a fun story, please submit it. We'd love to share it um, with the community right now while we're all kind of disconnected since we can't meet together. Um, Dee, I'm gonna email you. I just got your message. Um, <laughs> I'm going to uh, end tonight's meeting. Thank you all so much for being part of this and for coming here tonight. I hope you all stay safe and well. Thank you.